Welcome to this taster lecture from the module Happy Families, Crime, Abuses and Inequalities, which is on offer in the undergraduate degree programme in criminology and is also an mo option module for policing students. Um, this lecture is based on uh, a section that I teach in lecture five called Reporting Domestic Abuse to the Police in the UK. My name's Sarah Page. I'm a senior lecturer in sociology and criminology Criminology at Staffordshire University in the School of Law, Policing and Forensics. So normally in this lecture, I would go through some of the context of domestic abuse, talk a little bit about the non-reporting of domestic abuse. So why is it that um, victims of domestic abuse do not report to the police? And then share some research findings around the victims' views of the police, talk a little bit about police in practice um, in relation to domestic violence and also police power, so the policy context at the moment for domestic abuse, and then talk about some of the research findings that I found um, when myself and Dr M. Templemole were researching on a project called Breaking the Cycle of Domestic Violence. This is the UK picture of domestic violence. Um, one in four women have experienced domestic violence at some point in their lifetime. And that is also true for one in seven men. If we start to look at lesbian, gay and bisexual and transvestite community members and transgender community members, um, we see one in four experiences domestic violence in their lifetime. So again, similar to the female picture and disabled women and also men are twice more likely to be victims of domestic violence than non-disabled people. So actually those with disabilities are more likely to be a victim of domestic abuse. Domestic violence affects approximately about 200,000 women a week here in the UK. And on average, a woman experiences 35 assaults from her partner before she reports it to the police. So we need to understand some of the reasons and rationale for this non-reporting behaviour because 35 assaults is, is quite a substantial amount before reporting an incident to the police. Two women a week in the UK are killed by a partner or by a former partner. And according to statistics, domestic violence accounts for approximately 11 percent of all violent incidences that are reported to the police in England and Wales here in the UK and all of these figures are recorded in Griffith's 2017 journal article and the, most of it is based on the Office for National Statistics data here in the UK. So that gives us a picture of the extent of the problem of domestic violence and also gives us a sneak preview into the fact that people aren't reporting the crimes to the police. Under present legislation, the evidence is that for the majority of domestic violence cases, behaviours start with controlling behaviour and emotional and verbal behaviour towards the individual. Um, it's usually um, put downs and negative comments um, that make someone feel small and start to erode self-esteem and confidence. So that's the kind of behaviours that we start to see over time. And these behaviours increase over time until there is the threat of violence or restrictions of movements that end up um, being involved in the, the situation. So maybe the abuser starts to say, you can't go there, you can't speak to that person. If you do that, I might just hit you, you know, or that, that really inbreding fear into the victim that they're going to be shouted at or experience aggression in some way, or they're going to be told off, or they're indeed going to end up being hit in some way or physically um, abused in some way. 
When violence does occur, it's usually in a response to jealousy, suspicion or possessiveness and the offender will persuade the victim that it was all their fault. So if you hadn't have chatted to that man, I wouldn't have needed to hit you. You made me do this to you. So these are some of the statements that Hoyle and Sanders in 2000 reported that victims had been told. So that's the kind of spectrum that we see leading towards violence. And very often someone is in a controlling um, relationship and that goes on for a, a period of time before the physical violence because the perpetrator is involved in eroding confidence and eroding self-esteem and eroding the support, support networks in place for that particular victim. As a result of the recognition of this journey into um, violence, the UK government decided to make coercive control illegal. That controlling emotional and verbal behaviour, that restrictions of going to places and talking to certain people, we decided here in the UK that that would then become illegal. And that allows a victim to see that right from the start of the relationship, those behaviours are wrong, rather than very often um, it can be that the victim is, has reached the point of being beaten up and sees that as wrong but all of the previous behaviors they thought that that was okay legally now we know and we're trying to get the message out in the UK that all of the the preceding behaviors of an unhealthy relationship we're choosing to say that that controlling behavior is illegal too so I want to draw on the research from Hoyle and Sanders in 2000 about the UK policing of domestic violence Domestic violence units and also domestic violence officers provide a specialist intervention and help for victims of domestic violence. And it came about as a result of recommendations from the 1990 Home Office Circular on Domestic Abuse. And research has shown that domestic violence officers provide really um, positive support to victims. So the approach from the 1990s onwards towards domestic violence and having specialist trained officers and units to respond to domestic violence meant that victims got a better deal. However, um, part of the raw deal that victims have had about domestic violence has been some of the attitudes towards domestic abuse. So one approach to policing is this idea that it's the victim's choice. It's the victim's choice. They're staying in that relationship. They could leave if they wanted to leave the relationship. And the police would only choose to pursue um, domestic abuse if the victim would testify about the situation. And very often the victim wasn't willing to testify and so the police decided to ignore the abuse and ignore the coercive context that was playing out in the domestic violence relationship and also ignore the further risks to the victims and anyone else that might engage in a relationship with the abuser. So another approach to policing is something called the pro-arrest approach and this utilizes domestic violence officers to arrest in the interest of safety so the view is actually no arrest the person irrespective of testimony from the victim um, if there is some evidence at hand let's arrest to make sure that the victim is safe and that the all other people in society are safe from this individual as well. And the view of this pro-arrest approach is that it will reduce re-offending. It allows the victim time and space from the perpetrator while the perpetrator's being uh, rest, arrested to be able to clarify um, what the situation is with the victim and allow the victim space to reflect and think about whether or not they want to take action and what action they might want to take. Hoyland Sanders in 1996 interviewed 65 women in three different 
police areas in the Thames Valley area, which is London area, and found that many women contacted the police because they wanted some respite from the abuse. And they thought that the police would reduce further abuse and that they might help the offender to change in some way. So a lot of the women said, I simply wanted some respite. I wanted some space from the abuse. And I was hoping that the police contact with my abuser would scare the abuser to change their ways so that I could carry on having a relationship with this individual. Many were frightened of further violence at a later date if the offender is actually arrested which is the main reason as to why women might not proceed with prosecution. And another reason often cited is when women think their partners need therapeutic help rather than prison due to traumatic past and or drug or alcohol misuse. So in a lot of the research about women not reporting to the police, the reason that they don't want to follow through with an arrest is because they think that if the partner dealt with their past abuse that they've experienced, maybe they've had an early childhood trauma that needs resolving, or if their partner simply stopped drinking, etc., or taking drugs, then they wouldn't be abusive. And so they're more welcoming of the police to give them that respite moment and to maybe scare their partner into changing their behaviour rather than actually wanting them to have a prison sentence or a community sentence and actually have a criminal record. Part of that reason is they believe that their partner might change and the other part is the fear of repercussions from their partner. So there's some of the reasons of why people don't end up reporting to the police. When arrest and prosecution is offered alongside continued support to leave the abusive relationship, ongoing violence is likely to stop. Arrest and prosecution alone is unlikely to prevent, prevent further issues for the victim if she remains with her partner. So when partners remain together, the, the situation is usual that there's repeat offending that takes place. However, if there's an arrest and there's prosecution, plus the victim is given support to think through her actions and think through what she's wanting from life, Usually the violence at that point stops because she's willing to leave the partner and try to, to move on in her life situation. So in the UK, under the Crime and Security Act of 2010, sections 24-3, um, the police can do the following in response to domestic violence. Under Clare's law, the police are able to tell people that the person that they are with has a violent history and that the person has a record of domestic abuse and this can be done on request from anyone in society so you can approach the police and say I'd like to know whether or not my partner has an abusive past or alternatively the police can inform someone if they think that they're at risk of vulnerability and police can be quite proactive about that. So they may track an offender, notice that the offender is starting to build relationship with someone in the community and decide to approach that person and inform them about their partner. So that particular approach within Claire's Law does rely on really good community policing and community police officers knowing the community and knowing the relationship situations and the people within their community. The reason for Claire's Law was due to the number of women um, that get assaulted again and again and the number of people that ends up in abusive relationships. Um, so this is part of the reason for this disclosure scheme and we can hear more about Claire's Law. There's a, a link to a YouTube clip that I'd like you to watch. Um, you won't be able to utilise the link, unfortunately, from the MP4 um, audio file of this lecture. So I'll put it up separately in one of the discussion boards so that you can discuss Claire's Law in a little bit more depth. <coughs> the other thing that the police can do is a domestic violence protection order where the police apply for a magistrate decision of 14 to 28 days where the offender is not allowed to access the family home and there's other conditions that can be set. If the offender breaches, then the police can detain the offender. 
So here in Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire, very often in a domestic violence police protection order, the magistrate will request that the perpetrator attends a perpetrator programme and starts to get support for their behaviour. Um, and that's some of the things that they can do as well as saying you can't go to this location and you can't go to that location, etc. So there's some proactive things that can happen. Unfortunately, by the time that the community organisation that processes those orders and is supposed to support perpetrators on the perpetrator programme, by the time they connect with the perpetrator, very often the order has expired, the 28 days has expired and very often the perpetrator isn't interested in them pursuing that kind of support. The other situation is that the police can issue themselves directly a domestic violence protection notice and it has to be issued by someone that's superintendent or above, so a higher ranking officer. And this basically is an interim order. So for the, for the 14 to 28 days, it has to go to a court for a magistrate to give that order. So there's a few days before the offender is likely to attend their court session. And in those few days, the police order covers the same conditions to ensure that the victim's safe and that the perpetrator isn't able to access the victim. So that's some of the things that the police can do in order to protect victims of domestic abuse. So what are the victims' views upon UK policing of domestic violence? Robinson and Stroshine in 2005 conducted 222 interviews in Wales with domestic violence victims about their expectations of the police intervention and the satisfaction levels that they had of police practice. All of the victims were women and had a history of victimisation and liaison with the police. The majority were satisfied with police interaction with them and these were some of the things that they commented upon. When police complete the paperwork thoroughly, the crime incidents reports are properly completed, this was perceived positively by the female victims. Also, prompt response times were viewed positively as well, so from the point that the victim contacted the police to the police arriving at the destination of where the offence was taking place, a prompt time was seen as a really positive impact where victims had to wait a long time before a police turned up to intervene and that was seen as, as very negative. When police act in accordance with victims' wishes, there's more satisfaction. So, for example, if the victim is saying, I don't want the person to be arrested or I do want the person to be arrested, and the police took on board what the victim was saying and worked with the victim on getting the best outcome for the victim, that was seen as a really positive thing. The police demeanour had an impact upon satisfaction levels. So when police displayed concern, compassion and respect, these were perceived positively, particularly if police officers took time to listen to the victim. That was seen as, as really positive policing practice. When the victim was questioned separately to the perpetrator, um, that was seen as a really positive intervention as well. There was a lot of concern about when the victim was questioned um, and the perpetrator was in the room. So that was, that was one of the things that was seen as positively. Interestingly, all of the victims were conducted, connected to a multidisciplinary women's support unit with a seconded specialist police person working them, with them. So one of the questions from this research is if there is a specialist unit that's set up to support women that's multidisciplinary and has other organisations providing counselling support um, and, and trauma support and attending to mental health needs and things like that, that was the context that these women said that they had a positive experience of the police and the related services. some further criticism in my own research. So just to summarise this lecture here in the UK, policing practice of domestic violence and domestic abuse is improving. Um, the police powers are getting better in terms of what they can do 
to address issues and let people that are vulnerable know that they're at risk and also in preventing abusers being able to access victims. Um, partnership working is seen as imperative to good practice as well as training for police officers and all those concerned in tackling the agenda. Our policy around domestic abuse here in the UK is getting better because it's capturing a greater sense of what is domestic abuse and who the abusers might be. However, victims are still cautious about reporting domestic violence to the police. They're, they're still caution and fear associated to reporting domestic violence and when the police have respectfully listened to victims and developed timely responses then policing practice has been viewed positive here in the UK. And then these are the references that I've used to formulate this particular taster session. And so in every lecture, you would get a series of references to literature so that you could go and check out those different sources and do some wider reading on the given topic. I hope you've enjoyed today's session and I look forward to meeting you soon.